Um, what I'm going to talk to you about, it's something that I believe is very, very interesting. Um, and uh, it's a big chunk of work that uh, we have been doing, I've been doing in collaboration mostly with Philip Rogers and uh, in Cincinnati and two of his students. And uh, we have done some pretty remarkable, oh, uh, kind of a, we have had some remarkable advancement of understanding of n equal two super conformal field theories in four dimensions. Um, there are three papers already out, and there are many more to come. I think at least three or four, maybe in the next you know, few months. I don't want to commit to any uh, particular day. Um, and you know, the bottom line is basically that we have a, we believe a complete classification of the simplest scenario, the rank one case of n equal two super conformal field theories. I'll go back to uh, all, what all those terms mean, and of course that does not mean that, that for the fact that we have the complete classification means that we are for sure right, we make some physical assumptions, but the uniqueness of our method is that if our assumptions are correct, then we get all cases. We are systematic in our studies, so there could not be any more theories out there that we have not seen. Unless, of course, we made a mistake in the assumption. Okay, so um, I have a quite a short uh, motivation, I have to be honest, I kind of implicitly assume that you already are uh, thrilled about the idea of studying conformal field theories. So if you're not, I don't know if I will be able to convince you in one flight, but I'll try. Um, so, of course, um, there are lots of beautiful structures that arise in conformal field theories, but there's one fundamental kind of reason, which is even um, very physical, and the fact that you can imagine the space of all possible theories, quantum field theories, as uh, being basically the space of uh, theories that you can reach with energy flows among fi between fixed points. And in 4D, we believe that all those fixed points are conformal theories. So in, in some sense, if we do learn a whole lot about conformal field theories with or without supersymmetry, we are really learning a whole lot about quantum field theory in general. This field has been tremendously active for decades, but especially lately with this developing of this conformal bootstrap techniques, there has been a revival of interest. And in particular, if you add to conformal invariants, you add an S, so supersymmetry, then you really have a lot of tools that you can play with to learn a whole lot about quantum field theory. So in some sense, if you're not thrilled about the mathematics, this is really kind of a perfect arena to learn about quantum field theory, to learn what are the possibilities out there. In fact, for instance, just to let you know, one of the results that we, saw, that we find is that the majority of n equal to super conformal field theory that we find do not seem to have any Lagrangian description, the so-called non-Lagrangian. Whether or not there exists a Lagrangian is a little bit of a philosophical question, but what I'm trying to say, the only reason why we can see those is because we can use these tools provided by conformal invariants and supersymmetry. So when we have those tools, we really see that there's many more quantum field theories that we can, you know, we, we would have expected in the, in the beginning. So to be specific, for the rest of the talk, we will be set on studying n equal to, so this is the number of supercharges, super conformal field theories in four dimensions with rank one. I'll go back to this meaning on rank one. Are you convinced that it's cool? If not, <laughs> you have another 55 minutes of, of me talking about conformal field theories. Anyway, so I'll try to be very pedagogic and hopefully even if, you, if you're not really an expert of n equal to supersymmetry, you kind of, I hope you can grasp uh, some of the, of, the, of the philosophy and you know, I will give you a 10 minutes more or less introduction of, the, of our approach. And uh, for most of you, it might, might sound kind of silly. Uh, so I'll go through things that are very trivial, but I will kind of present you in a different way that, that, that seems to be completely overkill in those cases. But hopefully once I get back and we will kind of develop the full approach, you will see that this like five or 10 minutes of introduction will hopefully further your understanding of, our, of the method. So let's start from the simplest possible gauge theories you can, you can imagine, just U1 gauge theories. For the time being, I'll be very heuristic, so we don't really need supersymmetry uh, for the discussion that I'm going to, do, to, give, to, to give. And so let's say you want to classify all possible U1 gauge theories. Those are really kind of trivial, they're all IR free for any kind of minor content that you can, uh, you can think of. And basically these theories are classified by just telling assigning each kind of scalar field, let's say, a, a charge under the U1 gauge group. And then the other kind of exotic thing is that you might have not just one field with charge, let's say two, 
but you have a bunch of them. So Ni kind of counts the number of fields through scalar fields, say, which charge uh, Qi. Because I'm heading towards n equal to supersymmetry, in the back of my mind, I'm assuming that anytime I have a scalar field which charge Qi, there's another one which charge minus Qi. But that's the extent that I'm using supersymmetry at the moment. So that's very simple. But now I'm telling you that you can look at those theaters in a different way. So instead of using this NIQI basis, so to speak, for describing those theaters, let's use two different numbers. Little n and capital N. Little n is the value of the beta function in, in, for the theory, which is related like that to the, to the Qs. And big N is the number of mass deformations, mass terms you can write in the Lagrange. Because I told you that for each field phi i, phi of Q, could charge qi, there's another field which charge minus qi. Basically, for each pair, you can write a term like this. So the total number of mass, of mass terms is just equal to the numbers of pairs of fields that you have. Again, very simple. I'm not saying anything crazy. That's our a little interesting aspect. So as I will describe you to you in a much more systematic way, we will use heavily the geometry of the moduli space of vacuum of those theories to classify them. So if you trust me, from that perspective, then this little n and capital N is the right way of looking at things. For instance, I will show you systematically that those, if you have a U1 theory with a, a value of a beta function equal to n, then the modular space of that theory is a cone. Just trust me for the moment, I will get back to it in a, in a few minutes, with a singularity at the tip. That's how the modular space of those theories will look like. There is a way to characterize the singularity. Again, I will explain to you how. And so you know that any U1 gauge theories where the masses turn to zero have this kind of shape and this little and an IN singularity, which is just a name, a mathematical name for that singularity. And the little n does not indicate in either the charges or the number of the fields, but indicates the number, the beta function, the value of the beta function. Okay? Then if you turn on the mass terms, if you just add mass terms to the Lagrangian, that singularity splits up in a bunch of other singularity, so the, the modular space will look more complicated, and the number of singularity that you get is exactly equal to the number of mass terms that you can write. Okay? So let's say that, you know, again, in our back of our mind, we want to be able to classify all those theories. So let's say I tell you, let's play this game. You know, I tell you I have a, a theory with which has this I4 singularity as a count, and I ask you what theory am I talking about? Again, you can't tell me what theory is it, because the, you know, what you know is the beta function is 4, but there's a bunch of different uh, assignment or charges and numbers of fields that you can fulfill that with. So at that stage, you can't tell me what theory I'm talking about. But if I tell you another information, that once I turn on the masses, it will split into 4, then you know that there is a total of 4 fields, and adding the fact that the aquanization, could, the, there is a condition. You cannot have the, the charges of your fields have to be commensurate for the aquanization, then you land in a unique theory. So if I tell you I4 plus the number of splitting after I turn the masses, you know that it's either a, a theory with four, four scalar, pair of scalar fields which charge one. If it splits into two, it's a two scalar fields which charge square root of two. If it doesn't split at all, then you have one Q one scalar field with charge two. Okay? So the bottom line is that I have to give you these two informations. Just the modular space alone does not... Questions? What if you have magnetic charges? Yeah, exactly. No, th this is a good question. I'm oversimplifying. The, really, the Qs are... The, uh, it's, it includes also that case. So I'm oversimplifying that. You're right. Okay. So... What about SU2 gauge theories? The, the, the thing follows a little bit, very kind of similarly. Now you just have a little bit more complications because the matter content is not defined by just numbers, but you have to assign representations of your matter content. Your, the value of the beta function has this more complicated um, form. Now I am assuming n equal 2 supersymmetry because this, this is only true at all loops in n equal 2 supersymmetry, otherwise. The, the, the expression for the beta function is different. Um, and then you have this, so uh, this is the value of the function, and um, you have like a little more feature here. So if you have a little two millimeter mass, 
then the beta function is negative, that's a standard case for QCD. So you have an asymptotic free here, right? If the, uh, you add more matter, and you get to make, you make the beta function to vanish, then you have a, you have a conformal theory, and if you add even more matter, then the beta function becomes positive, and you go into IF3D case. Now, again, it's a very simple exercise. This is the beta function, is minus 4 plus the sum of this, um, this particular quantity that is associated with its representation. And by knowing that the index, the limit index of the adjoint is 4 and the fundamental 1, then you can just play around and you see that there is two ways to make it vanish. Either you add four fundamentals or one adjoint. Those are the two conformal things. It's good? So how does that look from the modelized space? Now, the same thing up here is a count, but I don't know if you notice, there is a star up here. That star is not purely aesthetic, but because the singularity at the tip of the cone, it's different, and I'll tell you how to, to, to discriminate between the two. And so, if I tell you that there's a modulized space with similarities I and star, then you know that the star tells you that it's an SU2 theory. If there was no star, it would be a U1 theory. And the little n, once again, it's the value of the beta function. So you see that the value of the beta function is really what matters for, for this approach. Now, once you turn on mass deformation, things become a little more complicated, so the splitting is not really giving you the number of mass deformation, but it's proportional to it. So in particular, let's look at this example, which we'll go back to it quite a bit. So let's say I tell you, again, the same challenge. I I'll tell you that I have a modelized space, which has this geometry, which I call I0 star. And I ask you, what theorem am I talking about? Well, the star tells you there's an SU2 theory. The zero tells you that it's a conformal, so the beta function vanishes. But once again, you have two options. Either the four, the four flavors or one adjoint. Those are two possibilities. Right? So alone, this information does not tell you what theory I'm talking about. But I can, if I tell you that this splits into six, then let's say you knew how to compute the number of mass deformation given the number of singularities. I'm going to tell you how. But you, you can believe me that if it splits into six, then it's four flavors. If you split it into three, it's one adjoint. Okay, so once again, if you know the initial singularity and how it splits, then you are golden. Okay? So now, if you think that this is a kind of like a trivial exercise, um, this is a kind of an incentive to listen to the rest of the talk. Because, thank, I mean, one of the objectives of the talk is to actually understand this table better. Um, so, this, th this theory is here, up here, and up to here, were the known theories in rank one. But, I mean, in the last two decades, that, those are the known theories. And by just doing this systematic approach, gener generalizing what I just told you about this geometry for all possible theories, we were able to find at least, we are certain that we found six new theories, but there are actually more that I didn't write on, the, on, on, on this page yet. But we basically doubled the numbers of n equal to SCFT is now. Okay? So this method really gave us a lot of information on what is can be out there. So this is just to make sure I'm following. So these are these are CFTs that are claimed to be the somehow the, the, the UV fixed points from which these mass deformations descend. Right. Yeah. And and these uh, these theories have moduli spaces or do not have moduli spaces? Uh, yes, I mean, they, they have a Coulomb branch. They have a Coulomb branch. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be more specific. Uh, you haven't described what the singularity is. No, I haven't described anything. I'm not going to be yeah. systematic. Yeah. But basically, that's the only uh, That's how we define the rank of those here. Because, you know, besides, unfortunately, you can't see this This theory is, is shaded in yellow, this theory is shaded in yellow, and this theory is shaded in yellow. Besides those three, everyone else is non Lagrangian. So the rank of those non Lagrangian theories is defined as the dimensionality, the complex in complex dimensionality of the Coulomb branch. So that's the same assumption. If there is a, a conformal field theory that does not have a Coulomb branch, we can say, I mean, we can say something about it, but it's better. Mm -hmm. So which one is the Argyris Douglas point of SEQ? Uh, so the, the, this, the, the, these are the Argyris Douglas theory, this theory here, which are the least interesting in our case. Uh, okay? So hopefully, by the time, at the end of the talk, uh, we understand this table better. Great, any questions? So, 
Now, let me try to be systematic. Hopefully we get a, a, a taste of what we are heading towards. And so, in the first part, I'm going to discuss the geometric structure of the Coulomb branch. So I'll be more specific. I will show you what, how those cones arise and everything else, and introduce even more systematically and equal to supersymmetry so that we're not just heuristically talking about things. In the second part, I will tell you exactly what is the situation for conformal field theories and how the, the splitting that I told you in, in the beginning generalizes the generic theories. And then in the third part, I will describe the, how to get that table and how we can classify all those theories. And the last part, I'm going to entertain this possibility that we might have found it wouldn't, uh, you know, I'm very, very cautious and you only got four theory. And by, the reason why I'm very, very cautious is because, uh, you know, it's a, it's a strong claim. And in fact, more than like claiming that we have found these theories, I will tell you why we think so. So just tell you what are the evidences that we found so we can, you know, if you have any suggestion whether we are wrong or, you know, make it more solid, then I would be really happy to discuss that. Okay? Okay, let's start from the Coulomb branch. So, n equal to supersymmetry. Let's be more systematic. I'm, I'm going to assume uh, n equal 1 supersymmetry. But if you know equal 1, then you should be able to follow the, the rest of the talk. So, the idea is that a vector multiplet, which is the, the multiplet that you have if you basically want to describe a gauge theory, where the gauge boils and lies, the vector multiplet for n equal 2 supersymmetry can be understood in n equal 1 language as a vector multiplet of n equal 1 plus an f n equal 1 pattern multiplet. Okay? So a vector multiplet of n equal 2 contains one complex scalar, this guy phi, two fermions, and a vector boson. Because they're all in the same multiplet, they're all transformed under the same representation of the gauge group, which is in particular the adjoint. Okay? So let's think about, so what is the special feature of this guy? Is that the vector multiplet contains a scalar in it, which is not true in n equal 1. And you can give a path to a scalar without breaking Lorentz, Lorentz invariance. Therefore, generically, there is a, a, a moduli space of vacua just by giving a path to this guy. We call this moduli space of vacua the Coulomb branch. So that's what we're going to discuss. For the time being, Coulomb branch just means the, bad, the space of paths of this guy, phi. So how does that look? Well, phi belongs to the adjoint. So I can use gauge transformation to actually put all the, all the, um, all, all the uh, put zero entries um, in all the non-diagonal uh, terms of the, of the matrix. So you basically have n, these A's are complex, so you have n for SUN uh, guy, you have n complex number. And if, you have, if this is SUN, this has to be traceless, that's the definition of the adjoint. And so you have n complex guy with one condition. So it's n minus one dimension. So for the time being, we're really trying to shoot much lower than that. So let's focus on SU2. SU2 phi is just a two by two matrix with zero entries, traceless, and zero entries off diagonal. So it's just described by one guy, A. So for the time being, what I'm going to describe is only Coulomb branches, which are one complex dimension. Does that, if, if these values are non zero, do you actually preserve n equals two or only n equals one? No, n equals two. N equals yeah, two. That, that, that's the whole point. Yeah. And you know, I mean, just, just uh, a side note that you might. So, one of the reasons why I think it's very important that Higgs branch, the Coulomb branch is kind of preferred compared to the Higgs branch to study these guys, is that you can study all the possible the relevant deformations that you can turn on. And all the relevant deformations that you can turn on of the n equal 2 SCFTs. Does uh, preserve the Coulomb branch, so there is no uh, relevant information that lifts the Coulomb branch. Whereas, if you turn on the master and you lift part of the Higgs branch, so not only preserves n equal two, but it's also preserved as a, as a modulized. It, it might be changed to, uh, geometrically, but it's not lifted. But it makes it, so it's a kind of ideal to to follow larger. Okay, so I'll use u, not a. I mean, the reason why I use u, which is equal to a square, because of bar transformation, but that's uh, really a subtle. So for the time being, I'm using U as to, to parameterize the one complex dimensional Coulomb branch that I'm talking about. Physically, once you turn on VAV U, the gauge group is broken from SU2 to U1, just because that's the only thing that concerns this guy. Okay? So the Coulomb branch has much more um, geometric structure to it. And so let me give you like a three minutes kind of summary of Sabo-Witten theory. You might have heard about Sabo-Witten. That's exactly studying 
what kind of geometric structure this guy has. And so first off, um, there's another guy. So we, 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 we have, one thing we know is that we have a one complex dimensional space, which is the Coulomb branch. Second though, there is a holomorphic function of U defined on it. How do we understand that? Well, the holomorphic function is just the holomorphic gauge coupling. And again, this is just because this is, you, in conceptually, you can think that as of the, this tau basically is the gauge coupling, more or less, uh, philosophically. And the reason why the gauge coupling or tau depends on the value of the Coulomb branch bed is because the tau, the, the, the value of the gauge coupling in the IR clearly depends on the scale at which the SU2 gauge group breaks to the U1. That scale is given exactly by the, the VEV that you turn on. Okay? So you do expect that the gauge coupling in the IR depends on, the, on, the, on, the, on that scale, so that translates in a fancy language to the fact that there's a holomorphic, gauge cup, a holomorphic function of your Coulomb branch U, which again is just the, the IR uh, gauge coupling. The thing is, it's a little more complicated because there, are, there is electromagnetic duality, meaning that if you have a theory, let's say you have a theory with a holomorphic gauge coupling tau, that theory is, needs to be identified with any other theory that has a minus one over tau as a holomorphic gauge coupling. And similar with this shift by one, those are just, just take it as a principle. And you can obviously combine any of these two transformations and you obtain yet again a theory that needs to be identified. So not all values of tau really describe you describe different theories. And in particular, if you combine these two transformations, you get that any theory with a value of tau and any others that can be obtained by this transformation where A, B, C, and D are integers and uh, basically are entries of a matrix with the terminal one, right? This is the terminal of this guy is one. So any assignment of those integers, you can plug it in here, make that transformation of tau, and that describes the similar theory. This guy forms a group that's called SL2Z. So there is an action of SL2Z over the holomorphic gauge coupling tau. So let me kind of briefly summarize what I've been talking about. So again, take a point of the Coulomb branch, this is my beautiful Coulomb branch, not complex dimensional, so do two real. And let's just sit in a point. At that point, there is a value, a defined value for t, for tau, for your function, for your gauge coupling. And then now take a loop and come back to the same point. How does tau, this function, transform? Does it need to go back to the same value? The answer is no, right? Because what you need to do, you need to go back to the same physical theory. But there are many different values of tau that describe the same physical theory. So along this gamma, this path gamma, tau can go to any other value if in, uh, for an element of sf 2 So you don't know really what are you going back to it, okay? Now, in order for having a not, so if you have a, a loop that goes back to a different value of tau, then you pick up a matrix from sf 2 which are basically the one that describes what is the new value of tau. And I'm telling you that you can only pick up a non-zero matrix, non-trivial matrix, if you have a singularity in between. Why is that? Well, if you don't have a singularity in the middle of the loop, you can think about shrinking that loop to nothing. Right? As you shrink in the loop, the matrix that you pick up should vary continuously. Right? You just like, you know, it just depends on what you're ending on. And if you're able to shrink the loop to zero, to nothing, then once there is no loop, there is no matrix you can pick up. Right? So if there is no singularity, then your initial matrix that you pick up should be continuously deformed into the identity. But those guys can only be integers, so there's no way you can continuously deform an integer to the identity. So either it's not the identity, or it is the identity. Right? So the, 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 bottom, the bottom line is that you need to have a singularity in order to have a non-trivial matrix. And let me tell you one more thing. The fact that you have a single, actually two more things. How do we interpret this physically? That was one of the most, in, the most insightful part of the sub theory. The presence of a singularity on the Coulomb branch represents a point in your theory where there is extra stuff, extra BPS states that become massless. So that's a very, very clear physical interpretation. And, um, and the point is that you can only also, you're going to have either one massless state, two massless states, or many massless states. 
So the fact that you have a single singularity does not constrain you on how many massless states you get at that particular point. And an extra piece of information, it's called the multiplicity of the singularity. So the multiplicity of the singularity really tells you how many massless states you get at that point. No, so, so you need to know how many singularities there are. Right, yeah, exactly. Those are two, yeah, those are two different. Perfect. Yeah, you can have multiple singularities, and each singularity can have multiple multiplicity. Great, so a summary, if you uh, lost me a little, uh, for a second, is that this, 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 this thing that I'm talking about, it's just a cool, it's one complex dimensional uh, variety, space, whatever, and um, needs to have singularities, and those singularities are characterized by going around them and checking what kind of matrix you pick up on your value of the whole morphic gauge gap. So you, you start with the value of tau, you go around, and you come back to value of tau up to a matrix, and that matrix identifies the type of singularity that you have answered. So it, hopefully you're already kind of thinking, oh, you know, that's how I can distinguish between the IN star and IN, by just going around and see what kind of matrix do I pick up. Okay? So that, that's the extent of something that we really need to know. Any questions? So you had said that uh, um, uh, BPS states have to become massless, not just other states. And that's basically because tau as a holomorphic function has to become singular? Is that the correct statement? Uh, yeah, no, because we, actually, I mean, the way, the way you see it is that basically why what why happens... Could, yeah, why, why couldn't they... So I'm not saying that it would not be enough for some non-BPS states to become massless. Is that a correct statement? Uh, yeah, so basically um, what, what really happens, I mean, there is a geometric understanding of what happens in the singularity. And I, there is basically, there is this like, you know, one complex dimensional base manifold, and there's a fiber, which is a, a, a torus, basically, that represents, um, which basically contains the information of, of the whole morphing H coupler. And, and through kind of integrating the subway with the one form around the cycles of the torus, you basically compute the BPS mass of, of some states. And then you can check that what happens in the singularity is one of these integrals goes to zero. So it's a kind of, there is a geometric understanding that there is really the mass of BPS states that, that collapses. It's just the, the BPS nature of the states that are huh? That it has to be a BPS. Yeah, because, I mean, because it, that's what the, the, the cycles, the integral of the one form around the, around the cycle, that's what they can do. <laughs> compute the central chart, I mean, the, compute basically the mass of BPS. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and you, and you know, you see this geometric, geometric picture, the one of these cycles just shrink to zero, that tells you that basically the mass of the BPS is zero. Okay, so um, um, so hopefully I haven't lost uh, all of you. Um, so we, we basically we have discussed what happens in a pull on branch for generic gauge theories. Now I want to tell you, what I want to get to the cone, and so I want to add the information that these theories aren't just generic, but are conformal. Okay, so if I ask you the question, okay, let's say I, I assume, can you guys see this? If I write on a boat, sure. is it kind of see? So if I ask you, I have a column branch, as John said, you can have multiple singularities, and now I'm telling you how many I'm asking how many singularities can I have if I assume that that Coulomb branch actually is a Coulomb branch of a conformal field. Now U has a non-zero mass dimension, and let's assume you have two. If you just have two, then there is the distance between these two guys is a scale in the field, right? This is this is fixed, it's given by the theory, so it should come from a scale in the theory. Now, if the theory is conformal, you can't possibly have a scale in the theory. So that's the easiest way to understand that, of course, if you have two or more, it's the, the argument goes as well. So that's the easiest way to see that you can only have one singularity. Nothing more than one singularity is allowed. That's, that's a very kind of um, constraining result. And the other thing you can get is that instead of having a planar geometry, you can have like a, I mean, it is a planar geometry. Instead of having an actual plane, there's a deficit angle. And so basically, you're, you're the only kind of exotic thing you can get is different cones. And again, hopefully you remember that those cones appeared, and I gave you from God in the beginning, and now they're kind of uh, appearing more constructively. Furthermore, and on, on this I'm uh, uh, skipping the result, the, detail, the details, if you add the monotomy 
this has to be an asset to Z. If you add this extra structure of this uh, particular matrix you have to pick up, then you can show that not only you have only codes, but only seven possible codes. That's not our result, that's a very well-known result in mathematics by Kodaira, and it goes under the name of Kodaira classification. So, the basic result is that if you have, if you ask what are possible Coulomb branch geometries for n equal to superconformal, superconformal field theories, then the answer is seven. One of them, hopefully is already familiar, this guy is the I0 star that I described in the beginning, but you have six more that, um, actually don't have interpretations like Lagrangian theories. Now also, notice that this guy, this column here, so this is the matrix that you pick up once you go around the loop, but once you go around the loop around the singularity. This is the scaling dimension of the Coulomb branch parameter. I mean, if you fancy, this is the actual explicit form of the sub witten curve describing this geometry, but it doesn't really matter. Sorry, what, is, what, is the, what is the basic restriction that fixes the possible scaling dimensions? Um, yeah, so... What's the idea? I know you can't. It's, 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 it's very simple if we, if we have a, you know, 20 minutes to describe it. It's basically the idea that you, you go around the singularity, in, around the loop. And because going around the loop is basically is the action of the, it, it, you can obtain that loop through the scaling action, you can derive basically, given the, the geometry, what is the matrix that is picked up by the homomorphic gauge cup and tau once you go around the loop. And that matrix is, cannot be generic but has to be one of this, belong to one of the six conjugate classes of SM2. Okay. So there's a very kind of like strict, strong restriction from there. Okay. So that's what, that's what you ask. You ask that the matrix that you pick up, it's part of SM2. Okay, and uh, look at the last column. Um, this is the multiplicities of, 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 the, of the singularity, meaning that this guy, the two star, whatever that, you know, doesn't, you don't have to be familiar with this term, has 10 massless guys at the, uh, at the tip, this guy's a 9, and so forth. Okay? That's the number of mass terms. No, no, those are massless. This is the multiplicity of the singularity. So there's okay. one singularity, and this is the number of massless states, the, the uh, BPS states that become massless at the singularity. But that's related to the number of deformations. Uh, uh, it's related, but in, uh, in a non trivial way. Yeah. I, I, I'm, uh, you're right, because I'm a little oversimplifying the picture. This is a, strictly the multiplicity of the, of the singularity, and yeah, I'll, I'll, let's not, I'll tell you more. And then these two, last two, uh, there, there's kind of two infinite series of geometries which are also allowed, those are the IR free theories. The reason why IR, IR, IR is that they're not really cones, they're more cusps. Um, but this is the IN theories, the, the U1 theory that I, I described in the beginning. It is the I star N theory that also I introduced. Right. So now, question. How many theories do we have in N equal 2? And you would be tempted to say 7. Right? This is just one for each one of those. But hopefully, hopefully, my little silly introduction tells you that knowing the, the geometry in the scaling band case is not enough to know exactly what numbers of theories that are out there. Right? So that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. Now, I want to, first of all, kind of convince you that the right way of thinking about mass deformation from a geometric point of view is really the splitting of the singularity. So how do I see mass deformations? For that, let me introduce very briefly the n equal 2 hypermultiply. And n equal 2 hypermultiply, again, in n equal 1 language, is just a q, a q bar, where those are chiral and antichiral. Uh, Superfluids. Now, if you want to introduce a mass term, this is an explicit mass term for Q bar and Q, there's also another term that behaves like a mass term. And this guy, phi, is exactly the, the scalar component of the vector multiple. This comes from basically the n equal 2 completion of the Iraq operator, so to speak. This comes from n equal 2. This is the guy, the scalar component of the adjoint. So you see that if I turn on a valve of this guy, which is going off the Coulomb branch, this effectively, even if this guy is zero, this gives a mass to my hypermultiples. If I turn both of them together, then you have an effective mass equal to whatever term I turn on, mu is the actual explicit mass term, plus the Coulomb branch valve. So let's see how that uh, works out. So let's think first of all if mu is zero. 
If mu is zero, then the mass of these guys is simply proportional to the Coulomb branch back. Right? So if mu is zero, and so I'm in a conformal case, then I expect that these guys will become massless for u equal to zero. So I'm expecting that there is only one singularity and is exactly the tip of the cone. Right? Which is consistent with what we've seen so far. Now imagine if you turn on two different masses. You can ask where do the hypermultiplet become massless? And if you want and you two are different, then you have did the two become massless in different points for different values of u. Which translates into the fact that the singularity splits into two. There are two different points in the Coulomb branch where there is shit that becomes massless. Okay? So that hopefully convinces you that from the Lagrangian point of view, we build it up that really, in order to talk about mass deformation, we need to talk about split. That's the right thing to look at. Any questions? So let me go into how do we, we hopefully, we build out that, that idea. There are seven scale invariant geometries. Now we have to ask, how do we split the single lines? And hopefully we can get it to classifications of physical geometry. So first, the conjecture. Let me be very clear. So we claim that the n equal 2 SCFTs, n equal 2 superconformal field theories, are classified by two numbers, two things, two data, not two numbers. One is the scale invariant geometry, which can be one of the seven that I told you that it exists. And then there is another actual information, which is the physical split, how that splits, how that singularity splits, which is, again, what I kind of introduced in the beginning. What our uh, work went into is what does that mean, physical? How do we classify those physical splitting if we don't know shit about those things? Right? I mean, if you have a Lagrangian, you can just turn, look at what are the mass terms that are allowed. But if you don't have a Lagrangian, how do you do that? Right? So that's the question. So remember, let me rem remind you, Corrado classification. Those are all possible theories. And, um, and let me tell you that any singularities can appear on the Coulomb branch should be one of those. One of those, you know, either one of the seven plus those guys. The reason being that any geometry, if you go close enough to the singularity, is basically locally scaling variant. So it must look as one of those entries. Globally, obviously, it's not scaling variant because there are multiple uh, singularities, so there are scales in the theories, but locally it is. Okay, so once I split the singularity, any of the dots that I get need to be one of those entries. So first rule, um, which really comes from, follows from mathematics, there is nothing uh, that we can do about it to, to violate this rule, that any deformations that is allowed needs to preserve the order of the singularities. Right? So, meaning if I start with a two-star singularity that is order 10, the resulting, the sum of the orders of the singularities that result from the splitting should add up to 10. Not 9, not 11, but 10. That just comes from the definition of what, the, even in, in some sense, you, those parameters, the masses, are continuous parameters, and you can turn that back to zero, and so everything is continuous. You cannot jump in that order. And so, what, the way I'll use uh, um, the, the, this is how I will indicate a, a conformal field theory. I will tell you first, that's the initial singularity, so this is a conformal field theory in our geometric language. This is the initial singularity, and this guy is, the, we call it deformation pattern, that is, the, the, the type of singularity that you get after the splits. Is this allowed? Well, we can count. We said that, I've told you there's only one rule, and the one rule is that the order of the singularity needs to be preserved. So let's see that this is, so that two star has order 10. Any in here has order n for given n. So, two sizes are 10, and then I have 6 I1, that gives me an order 6, plus 4, or 10. So this is, this is an allowed uh, split. Great. So if that, that was the only rule, you can kind of see that you get, you get a finite number of deformation just because there's just that many combinatorics that you can come up with, but you would get a ginormous number. You would claim that there are 389 
in equivalent n equal to SCFDs for rank one, which sounds a little impossible. And so we made, uh, th then the physics comes into place, and there are a bunch of other assumptions. It, because of lack of time, I will tell you some of the assumptions. If you want to know more about uh, the details of that, please talk to me later. Um, but I have to skip some of the details, otherwise it's physically impossible to actually tell you all about it. So just believe me that, you know, for instance, there is a way to check that the IR theory consider, preserves the Dirac quantization condition. You know, we really believe that the Dirac quantization condition is intimately related with, like, making sense of quantum field theories, right? So in order for the IR theories, after I turn on the mass deformation to do this back quantization, Dirac quantization condition, that, again, you should almost trust me, I didn't tell you why that's the case. If you have a bunch of n singularity, the square root of n's need to be commensurate. Commensurate means that the ratios of the square roots of the n's needs to be integer. Right? But once again, for instance, in that particular case that we had before, we had two stars going into I1 to the 6, I4. Right? And I tell you that those ends here, or whatever, happen, or whatever appears on the right hand side, need to be commensurate. The square root of those, actually. So square root of 1 is 1, square root of 4 is 2, and those are commensurate. The ratio is an integer. You couldn't have, for instance, I1s and I2s. That would not be commensurate. Okay? So that this reduces from this huge number to 34 already. And then there is added two conditions. One is the fact that the monotomy, let's say you start with an initial singularity, you had a particular matrix that you would pick up by going around it. Now you split them all. Clearly, going around all the singularity, and circling all the singularity, you need to pick up the same matrix as you initially picked up around the, the initial singularity. Why? Because again, by turning off the masses, the splitting will collapse it back into the initial singularity, so that the monotony cannot be discontinuous. So that reduces by x to the 9. And then there's a beautiful, uh, you know, in some sense, the intuition that the micro said, the fact that you can actually study a lot of IG flows, uh, this, you know, you can think of UV fixed points, and you, you can kind of say quite a bit about those IG flows, and they all have to be consistent. Now you might expect that this is not very restrictive, like it only cuts it by one, but that's not true, it's just because we have cut off already a lot, a ton of uh, unphysical theories, and the reason why we, turn, we kind of like impose these conditions this way is because this is a lot the hardest to impose, it uh, takes much more work, Presumably, if you impose this on the 389, first it will take you forever, second, you will probably cut off this number considerably. But again, this is the smartest way, so you, you first impose the simplest and then harder and harder, so you have less work to do. Questions? So this is back the, the table, hopefully it's a little clearer. So again, the, the table, you, you can read it, this is this is the initial singularity that you have once the mass are turned to zero. The second column tells you the scaling dimensions of the Coulomb branch, doesn't matter. The third column tells you the deformation pattern, what, what, what kind of singularities you get once you turn on the masses. Okay? And then, you know, incredibly so, by writing down the subordinate curve in one form and then doing other tricks, you can find out what are the flavor group of those theories and then compute the A and C central charges and even the, the flavor group central charge. So the, the cases where there's a dashed line, it means that there are no massive deformations. Right, that? exactly. Mm -hmm. You still think those, those theories exist. So, so again, to be really honest, this I1, I4, I1 star, and I2, those are, I have, the reason why we, so those are not really new theories, those are simple, simple U1 theories with a single hypermultiplet. So there is no mass. I mean, what, what that means that there is a mass deformation, but it doesn't split the singularity in some sense. For instance, if you have a U1 with one single hypermultiplet, you can turn on a mass, and it will just shift the, the location of the singularity around the okay. That's what it does. And, uh, and this table is arranged in such a way that, you know, the reason why we have a I1 series, a 4 series, and so forth, is that there is a kind of an arrow. Any, any, any theory, 
can be reached, in the I1 series can be reached by RG flows by the theories above them. And so forth for the I4 theories, the I1 theories, and so forth. So there's an arrow of RG flows going down for each one of those series. Okay? So there was a unique monodromy for the singularity. Under the splitting, is there a unique monodromy for each of the split points? Yeah, the, that's a great question. And um, the answer is surprisingly uh, hard to, to figure out. So we, 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 we found that the, the, the answer. Because, I mean, it, there's a subtlety, the fact that there is actually an overall uh, SF to G transformation that you can you can multiply things about. So it's much more comp you have very little control over the management. Okay. Okay. Oh. We, we Were any of them you have you need No, we, we didn't find no, we didn't find we find it easily. But we can't systematically trust them. It, but you know, in, in those theories, yes, that's why we, we imposed the monogamy at the very end, because we have gotten rid of many. So anyway, um, what what is interesting? Well, I don't I don't know if you remember this I zero star guy, which was the initial SU two theory conformal would be vanishing meta function. And at first, I told you that there are two theories, right? The one with four flavors, the one with one adjoint. How many of those do we find here? Well, there's an I zero star here, an I zero guy here, an I zero guy here. So there are three of them. So that's exactly what is n equal 4 theory comes about. So before I turn on to this, is there any question? OK. So let me spend the last 10 minutes, or even less, describing that. So as I told you, you start with an I0 star. And in that table, I showed you that, that we found by studying this thing systematically, again, it's the bottom up. I mean, the, the, the novelty of this is that we it's not that we find other geometries, we have a tool to systematically ask what are all possible geometries. Maybe some of those geometries are not realized as theories, but definitely they could not be, again, if our assumptions are correct, they cannot be theories that have geometries that we don't find. And I have to say, for the expert, we, we, we compute, we construct the sum of curve and the one form for each one of the entries of that table. Uh, so that, that's all written now. Anyway, so we found three different geometries, three different deformations. So let's study them in details. First one is this I0 star to six I1s. Okay? So what do we know about this theory? Well, I mean, if you write down the, the subwritten curve of this guy, you find that there are four mass deformations. Fact. The flavor group is SOA or D4. I mean, those are just two different names, but the same thing. And those that have appropriate center charge. But what I mean by that, I mean that the fact that it's four mass deformations make you think that this is the SU2. Again, this is an I0 star, so it has to be some sort of SU2. It's an SU2 with four flavors. And in fact, the central charges of, that we find match perfectly the central charges of the theory with S2 uh, with four flip. And then you can see that, in fact, if you take the mass is very large, the four mass is very large, then you have two of the singularities that kind of like stick together. And four of them then move fast. Those these two that stick together kind of should be interpreted as like the ionic singularities of the pure SU2 because you're giving like large masses, so around this, the, the origin, you basically have pure SU2 theory. And then the four similarities that are far away should be associated with, with places in which each one of these hypermultiples become massless. So how about this other geometry? So if you write down this, the subordinate curve, what you find is that there is one mass deformation that is an SU2 flavor group. You find that C equal to A. And there's an existence of what I call um, a mixed branch, two complex dimensional mixed branch. Now, these three things together right, smell like this, there is an enhancement of supersymmetry. 
Meaning that our technique, it only assumes n equal 2 supersymmetry, but for instance, there is no reason from n equal 2 why c is equal to a. n equal 4 imposes n c equal to a. And then you can, you know, you understand that you can interpret the SU2 flavor group as coming from the SU4R of, of n equal 4. And the existence of the mixed branch really tells you that basically your quorum branch is embedded in a much larger modelized space, which is, again, it's consistent with the idea that you are actually talking about an n equal 4 theory in n equal 2 language, uh, but the theory is actually n equal 4. Okay? So this is, in fact, the SU2 theories with one adjoint that I told you in the beginning that is, in fact, n equal 4. For massless adjoint, this is n equal 4. And again, you look at the geometry, and for large mass, again, you get that feature that one mass goes uh, far away, and, the other, you, and so you see the feature of a, a few SU2 dynamic singularities in the region of the modular space, and then the other singularities moves far away that is associated with the adjoint hybrid. So this really has the older structure to say, oh, you know, once I turn on the mass deformation, I restore n equal 4, and I actually talk about n equal 4 theory, not n equal 2. Okay? Now what about this guy? This guy has one mass deformation, has the IC2 flavor group, which again is consistent with enhancement of n equal 4, has c equal to a, which is again consistent with n equal 4, has this mixed branch, which is again consistent on n equal 4, so it really smells like this is n equal 4 theory. The real thing difference is that there seems to be a Z3 symmetry given by the fact that if you choose the mass and the holomorphic gauge coupling appropriately, these three singularities are in the vertices of an equilateral triangle, so you can rotate those singularities in certain ways. And this, this Z3 in the in the as duality group is not present in the standard n equal 4. So again, it seems really likely that we do have, this seems to be an n equal 4 theory, but again, with a different as duality group than the usual one. There is an exactly marginal operator, so it's not like it should be Lagrangian, I miss, how is the S-duality different from... Oh, so, I mean, I, I mean, so there, there is a... So, the, the S-duality group of the n equal 4 theory is in fact not SF2Z, but as a subgroup of SF2Z. And that subgroup does not contain a Z3. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a technical result. There's a... Um, basically, Cyber, Garoni, and Tachikawa showed that in this paper, they kind of studied the S duality group of, of n equal 4 theory, and they showed that, in fact, it's not the full SF to Z, but it's this gamma 2, 0, the gamma 0, 2 uh, subgroup. But you have an S and a T. Right, no, exactly. The, the point is that only a certain combination, not, they're not generated. They're not, both, both of them, they're not generated. There's only one, two certain combinations that are generated. There is this, they basically show that there are three phases for the, S, the SU2 that they call SU2, SO3 plus, SO3 minus. And by studying how the faces, I mean, it's a little technical, but you can, they, they, that's how actually we realize that this guy is new theory, right? Because we're, we're corresponding with Alfaroni, and he said there is no way the Z3 is there. And we're going to study more in detail, and it seems to be there, actually. Okay? Any questions? So the, the punchline is that again, I'm not claiming that there's a new n equal 4, but I'm just telling you that we find something that is very consistent with n equal 4 and has this extra new feature. And again, we don't really understand how to interpret those in our ideas. Anyway, so coming to conclusions. We propose a set of physical conditions which can really strongly constrain the geometries and the four, the possible theories that it can exist in n equal 2. We've shown that there exist at least new, uh, eight new theories, but up to 13. And again, after we publish this like, you know, list of new theories, 
Again, eight of those were actually constructed by alternative met methods. So we really believe that there is like a lot of truth in this. And we actually are on trying really hard to uh, generalize into to rank two. There's a very kind of interesting um, set of problems that we are making progress over. But, um, okay, I'll leave you with the actual. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I thought I had it. No, I didn't. Okay, I want to. I leave you. I want to leave you with the, the list of the actual theories, but I don't have it. If you want, I can show it too. Thanks. <laughs> So um, I've kind of maybe a thought.